Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 215 session on registered reports and results blind reviews, examples from social and personality psychology. Um, we got a great lineup today. We're going to have three speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce the general theme of what registered reports and result blind um, psychology might mean for our field. And then we're going to have some live examples that illustrate how this process can play out in the field of social and personality psychology, both at the level of publications and, importantly, in this context, in the context of conferences. Um, so thanks for coming. So I'm going to give a little 10-minute introduction or something like that. And um, we're going to have an extensive Q&A session at the end, or another way of saying that is we're going to have relatively short talks, one less speaker than we would normally have, and then 15 minutes of dead time. So please, if you have questions, you can use the SPSP app to submit them. You can do that at any point during the session. And Carrie is going to sit over there and sort of help monitor the questions and make sure they get through. And then at the very end, we're going to have a huge Q&A session where everybody's going to come up to the stage, sit on wobbly chairs, and have a great time. OK. So one of the foundational ideas in science is that to evaluate a claim, we need to have access to all of the relevant information, to all the relevant evidence. But as researchers, or as reviewers and editors, we use a variety of filters that allow only certain kinds of studies to be represented in the literature. Now, these studies, or these, these filters, typically prioritize the findings of the studies over the methods that are used to produce them. Now, this creates a situation where the published literature is more or less a selection of findings that resonate well with our the theoretical predilections and preferences. Um, it's consisted of findings that are filtered on the basis of how interesting or counterintuitive they may be. And of course, it's a bunch of findings that are selected on the basis of how statistically, they, how statistically significant they are, such as super, super significant, three asterisks. Now, as a consequence of these filters, someone reading the literature in psychology is faced with a most curious dilemma. Namely, if we see overwhelming evidence of support for a specific hypothesis, we don't actually know whether the hypothesis is supported. That is, we cannot differentiate this kind of situation, I'm not sure which screen to point out, um, where the studies are, in fact, representative of the broader literature or set of studies that have been conducted from this kind of situation, where they are not. Now, we've known that this is a problem for the field for a long time. We have a very bad word for this problem called publication bias. But for the most part, we've been able to ignore the problem because we haven't had a way to estimate the extent to which it plagues our field. Now, fortunately, in recent years, a number of very creative researchers have found ways to estimate to what extent publication bias might distort the nature of our empirical literature. Um, this paper by Franco and colleagues that came out a few years ago took an extraordinarily impressive approach to this, where they studied the projects that were submitted to the NSF-sponsored time-sharing experiment project. The test project is one in which researchers can propose a study that then the NSF, or the leaders of this project, go out and collect the data in a nationally representative sample. What's cool about this is that all the projects that are accepted are essentially archived. The proposals are archived somewhere. So we know exactly what the file drawer is like. And um, Franco and her colleagues were able to survey the people who were involved in these projects and under, or examine the fate of the various studies that were conducted in the test project. Now, one of the things they learned, which was interesting, is that some of the findings were not supported of the key hypotheses, whereas some of the findings were strongly supported of the key hypotheses that investigators were testing. So what I mean by strong in this slide is that, for the most part, the data were consistent with the hypotheses that the investigators set out to test. And of all the various projects that were done, the ones that were published 84% of them provided strong, consistent evidence for the key hypotheses. Notice that I'm still learning English, um, the, key the key hypotheses. My apologies for that. Um, however, not all the studies were ultimately published. And what we find among those projects that did not appear in the empirical literature, only 48% of those provided strong evidence in support of the key hypotheses. 
So another way of articulating this is that a study was three times more likely to be published if it produced, quote unquote, strong support for the key hypotheses. So that's one indication of publication bias and how it manifests in our field. However, the test project is for social science more broadly, political science, economics, psychology. What about our own backyard of psychology? How many of you are familiar with this amazing paper by Harris Cooper and his colleagues from the University of Minnesota, I mean Missouri? Oh, I love, I love being able to show things that people have never seen before. This is one of my favorite papers, and it's only been cited 100 times. Okay. This paper represented another extraordinarily creative way to solve the file drawer problem. Essentially, what Harris Cooper and his colleagues did was identify 178 studies that had been approved for, IR, or for approval, IRB approval for research in the Department of Psychology at the University of Missouri. And they followed up with the investigators of those proposals and tried to learn the fate of all the different studies that had been conducted. So of those 178 studies, for 155 of them, the um, experiment or the study actually began. That is, data were collected from research participants. And of that 155, 151 of the studies actually reached completion. So that's a good sign, right? If you start a study, chances are you're going to complete it. Okay. Of that subset, 121 reached the point where the data were actually analyzed. Then within that subset, 105 of them led to a written report. Now, Cooper and his colleagues also probed people and asked them why studies fell out at different phases in this process. And one of the an some of the common answers to this question are design problems. Keep in mind these are design problems that are identified after the results are known. Um, the results were not interesting or no statistically significant results. Of that 105 that were actually written, 55 were submitted for publication. Why were some of them not submitted for publication? Again, part of the issue has to do with the results themselves rather than the methods. Um, the results were not interesting, they were not statistically significant, or students and investigators lost interest in the project. Of those 55, finally 41 of them actually appeared in print somewhere, in proceedings, empirical journal articles, or in book chapters. And reasons why things ultimately were not published, this time usually boiling down to editors and reviewers. Results were not interesting, no statistically significant results. And again, after the results are known, design problems. So to summarize, of the 155 studies for which subjects were tested, findings of only 26% of them appeared in print where other people have the option to consume them, to learn from them. Many of the studies that ultimately did not get published were not published because of design problems per se, but because of problems with the results themselves, not being interesting, not being statistically significant, or not being earth-shattering in their theoretical implications. Now, why is this a problem? I'm going to state this in probably the most provocative way I can, just because I tend to be dramatic when I haven't had coffee in the afternoon. We cannot rely on the scientific literature to accurately represent what has been learned in scientific research. Even if the work conducted in individual labs is systematic and bias-free, the filters we use at the publication stage to decide what is represented in the empirical literature is not systematic and bias-free. And as a result, publication bias creates a situation where we actually don't know what we think we know and don't know what we don't know. Now, fortunately, we live in a new era where people are having all kinds of creative ideas and insights about how to improve the state of our science. And some of these ideas are extraordinarily exciting to me. One of the ideas that I have fallen in love with, and I've only fallen in love a few times in my life with coffee and my wife, um, and with some of these ideas, an ideal world we would evaluate research on the basis of the quality of the designs and the methods that are being used, regardless of the findings. Now, some of you may have had the opportunity to hear Joe Cesario's talk yesterday, which made me weep. I don't know if anybody else cried in the middle of a talk. But he reminded us that one of the reasons we become scientists is because we have a sense of curiosity and an interest in understanding how the world works. And basically what that boils down to is we have questions we want to answer. 
We're not committed necessarily to what those answers are. We're committed to the process of learning what those answers may be. And so the idea of a results-blind science, if you will, is one that reinforces the idea that it's the approach, the questions we ask and the methods that we use to get there that essentially defines the scientific process, not the results that we actually ultimately end up publishing in the literature. Now, there are a lot of ideas that have been in discussion lately, and I'll sort of briefly introduce two of those just as a way of providing context for some of the talks that are upcoming. So one idea that's been discussed a lot recently is that of registered reports, or what Joe Cesario referred to as peer-reviewed registered reports. Essentially, this is a process that journals or conferences can use where researchers propose an idea, a set of ideas that they want to examine, hypotheses that they want to test, and the methods that they plan to use to do so. And those are reviewed by editors and reviewers, and they might be changed, they might be modified a little bit, or they might be accepted as they are. But at this stage one review process, people are given an in-principle acceptance, where if they follow through with these various recommendations, the paper will ultimately be published regardless of the outcomes. So this is one potential mechanism whereby we can focus on the methods that are used to evaluate science without biasing our literature as a function of whatever the results happen to be. So this is a really important innovation. Um, as Joe highlighted, one of the outlets for this for social and personality psychologists is CRSP. It's a journal that he and others are editing right now. And I believe they're in their second or third year right now and very open to new reviews. So I encourage you to consider this as a, a potential outlet for future research. Um, another idea is sort of taking a step back and maybe a little less um, programmatic, but involves results, re result blind reviews. The idea here is that we might take a traditional manuscript that we would submit in psychology and blind the editors and the reviewers to the results sections of those manuscripts. As a result of such blinding, readers have no choice but to evaluate the importance of the question being asked and the quality of the methods that are being used to address it. And this could be one potential mechanism we could use to solve the publication bias problem in our literature. Um, one journal that is actively focusing on this in an experimental way is BMC Psychology. So they recently just sort of introduced the idea that manuscripts will be reviewed without any access to the results section. And um, the Collabra Journal of Psychology explicitly places emphasis on the design and the quality of the methods that are used to evaluate the studies. And explicitly, I guess you could say, this is a strong word, but. It, Place it puts in a back seat the theoretical innovation or importance of the findings themselves. So it's an explicit attempt to acknowledge the methods that are used rather than the findings that are produced as a result of those methods. Okay. Now in this symposium, we're going to approach the concept of results blind reviews and registered reports from two different angles. First, we have two talks, one from Lauren Campbell and one by Bill Chopik, in which they agreed to present the results of two research projects for which the data collection was not yet complete within, when the symposium proposal was crafted. Thus, this is cool, as an audience, we get the opportunity to hear what they have learned without the traditional filters that would typically be applied to research that's presented in a public context. Um, I should warn you ahead of time that I have seen Lauren's slides. Um, Trigger warning, if you're not into sex or sex toys, this is a really bad talk to listen to. Um, but I can't wait, okay? Um, Samin Vizar Vizier is gonna take a, a completely different approach to the issue. She's gonna discuss what it means to have a large, intense data set, um, yet be burdened with the knowledge of exactly what that data set is all about. Um, so she's, she's conducting an interesting experiment where she's asked people to pose questions that can be answered in her data set. So the people who pose the questions are doing so without knowing the outcome. And then Samin is going to share with us the outcome of that process and kind of what she learned along the way. So I'm really excited about that. Um, again, just a reminder, you can submit questions at any point in the symposium using the app. And again, we'll come together on stage at the end and everybody will have the opportunity to answer those questions. We've deliberately saved a lot of time at the end so that we can have a fun Q&A, so we'll, we'll defer all questions to the very end. Okay, so trigger warning in place. Lauren Campbell, you're up next. 
I'm very happy to be here talking about sexuality and relationships with you all today. I will also say that this project is, well, I was in New Zealand in 2013 talking about this with people before we started collecting data. So we're taking slow science very seriously. Uh, and as we have just really kind of got our results in within the past, I don't know, three or four months or so. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting the primary analyses today, even though there's a lot more to do, of course. I also want to take a moment to point out that Taylor Kohut deserves most of the credit for, for this, his Herculean efforts to uh, see this project through. He'd be here today, but he's in Croatia on a postdoc, so uh, he's just enjoying the coast uh, over there. And then, of course, Standard Innovation, which is a company that gave, uh, we had my first study with industry support, but I will say that they are very uh, gracious and they um, gave us contributions in, ter in terms of a donation, meaning that they had no input on the study design or told us to change things or uh, and no stipulations on what we do with the results or where we present them. And they know that everything was going to be uh, open and transparent along the way. So anyways, they provided us with money to run uh, pay couples as well as a product, which I'll, well, I'll show you. Okay, long story short, in relationships, it tends to be the case that relationship quality and sexual quality typically declines over time. It's not for everybody, uh, and some people maintain, some people drop more, more quickly, but on average, there tends to be a bit of a decline in both relationship quality and marital satisfaction as the relationship progresses. Now, Art, Aaron, and colleagues, and there's been others as well, of course, uh, have shown that uh, one way to maintain and enhance relationship quality is for couples to engage in novel and exciting activities together. You may be familiar with the study where couples uh, completed a task either on their own or by having their uh, wrists and their uh, ankles uh, fastened to each other while they had to navigate an obstacle course. And it's fun, and you giggle, and you laugh. You have to coordinate your activities, and immediately afterwards, you feel happier than you did before, suggesting that engaging uh, uh, Engaging these activities can be a boost to uh, relationship satisfaction and quality. Now, relationship quality, though, can be, uh, could, uh, may be sustained and improved through modification of couple sexual behavior. Uh, I have it on, you know, people tell me that some couples have sex at, like once a week even, uh, and it's something that's important to the relationships, and we know that relationship quality and sexual quality are uh, linked over time, probably in a bi-directional manner. Goals of the present research were to investigate the theorized impact of novel sexual behavior on different elements of relationship quality. And we took a lot of time to think through what we'd like the design to look like uh, and so on, and I'm gonna be presenting that here today. And so I'm gonna be focusing more on what we did and less on how we did it. That said, if you go to our project page, which I forgot to mention, there's a link to that on the slides, you have access to all the study materials our playbook, uh, you know, our scripts, uh, our you know, debriefing forms, our letters of information, uh, and all those things. The impact of experimentally prescribed novel sexual behavior on specific aspects of relationship quality has not been uh, measured. We have assessed a lot of things in relationships and we manipulated a lot of things in relationships, but we typically haven't manipulated sexual behaviors or sexual experiences to see what the impact that can have on, on the relationship itself. So, uh, as I mentioned before, sex, uh, couples have sex on average about once a week, some more, uh, those uh, other sex craze, uh, some less. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it, also sexuality and sex between partners is something that is very close and very intimate. You're, you're, you're literally naked before your partner, uh, unless uh, you like, you know, clothes on. But that's uh, for the, <laughs> the fetish department. Now, this is lifted from our pre-registration, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a mo like downstream. Remember, we pre-registered this roughly four years ago. So this is what we came up with at the time when we thought it was brilliant. Uh, the introduction of novel sexual behaviors in long-term heterosexual couples will positively impact perceptions of intimacy, passion, and sexual and relationship satisfaction. That's our pre-registered hypothesis. Today, I know a lot of you may say, well, that's very vague uh, and not very specific, and you're correct, and I'll talk about what we've learned along the way and how we've uh, changed things in our lab, but that's lifted from our pre-registration. Study design, what did we do? We had a pre-post randomized control study with three conditions. So what we thought was, well, let's have a condition where couples come in and they learn information about erogenous zones and sexual pleasure, where people like to be touched the most and so on. And this is something that maybe we don't, we don't have as much knowledge of this as you may think. Uh, so it actually is uh, helpful uh, uh, to couples. In another condition, they had all that, plus what's called sexual positions. I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then the third condition, they had all of that, plus what's called the we vibe, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. The manipulation was embedded within a 29-day diary study. 
So the manipulation occurred at day 15. Uh, they had five assessments prior to the manipulation, five assessments post-manipulation, where they were asked a series of the same sorts of questions at each time. When you bring couples in and you start asking them to monitor their sex lives and ask, ask questions about it, uh, well, they're going to start paying more attention to it themselves and start increasing frequency in sex. So we wanted to have a period prior to the manipulation uh, to kind of stabilize and get them used to the study design, as well as monitor it following the manipulation. The assessments were primarily done online, but the intervention occurred in the lab uh, one couple at a time. We, uh, at the time, we thought, well, let's shoot for a sample size of 150 couples or 300 individuals, so for 50 per condition, allowing for a contingency of attrition where we'd have at least 40 couples per condition, and we didn't want to stop until we had at least reached uh, that point. What we actually ended up with was 145 couples that were recruited, uh, whereas 17 did not complete post-intervention items, so we had 128 couples, but we still may, uh, managed to meet our minimum of 40 couples per condition, as you can see there. And some people have asked, well, were they students? Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, they are couples from the broader community of London, Ontario, Canada. Some were uh, uh, from on campus, most were not. Uh, we, we found that recruiting was challenging, and we came up with a lot of interesting ways uh, to recruit, and we decided to share our recruitment plan. So if you want to try to uh, give away free vibrators to couples, uh, you can use our materials uh, to do that. They're an average 30 years of age, so you know, uh, uh, range from 18 to 74, and they've been together about 88 months in total on average. So we had long-term committed uh, couples in, in the study. As they say, it took time. This is what we wrote uh, uh, about a year and a half later so after data collection. The study began recruiting in January of 2015. 20 months later, in September of 2016, we have recruited 97 couples, of which 86 couples have completed the manipulation. Why did we, we actually pre-registered this along the way uh, to show that we were making uh, a bit of a change in our approach without having looked at the data yet. Uh, part of that is, uh, I blame in a positive way, Daniel Lawkins, who came to our department and gave a talk, and we sat down and talked about sequential analysis. The idea of planning peaks at your data and adjusting the alpha accordingly. Uh, he's written about this, and so we adopted this in our own research. And the idea is if you peak at the first time and things seem to work, or you, you, your p-value is below the, uh, the chosen threshold, well, in that instance, you can say, stop. Uh, but if it does not, you carry on, and then you have a second peak. Uh, I will say we went all the way to the third peak, uh, and that's what I'm going to be presenting today. I'm not going to go through all of these, but we did have a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria that we stipulated in advance. Some of these were from the ethics board. They're, they came back and they go, what if they put the vibrator in the anus? Is, is that going to be a problem? And it's like... <laughs> And it's like, well, uh, they could put it in their mouth and chip their teeth, too. Uh, but uh, we're not necessarily going to tell them not to do that. So we had to kind of get creative uh, with the ethics board. Uh, and I, I would have liked to be in those, those meetings. Uh, in any event, uh, what you can see here is we did focus uh, at the beginning on heterosexual couples, though I had a great conversation yesterday with someone. This, is, this can be used in really creative ways uh, in uh, uh, same-sex relationships as well. Uh, that they're in a sexually active relationship, at least three years in length, who are living together and have reliable access to the internet. And then you see exclusion criteria, and one of them that was uh, challenging was that they couldn't be using certain barrier methods of birth control, partly because there is a small chance that, for instance with a condom, that uh, when it comes into contact with the vibrator it could tear, and now we're introducing a potential risk to the participants. So that's one of the reasons why it was a little challenging. But we stated these inclusion and exclusion criteria up, up front. Uh, what do the interventions look like? I'm not going to go through all of it. I will say this. The, the intervention itself was run by a real uh, research uh, assistant in the lab, uh, walking the couples through, but the actual intervention was pre-taped uh, for consistency, uh, and it was delivered. It took roughly half an hour, and the in-lab session took roughly an hour and a half. They received inter uh, an introductory discussion regarding basic sexual anatomy, erogenous zones, and areas that stimulate sexual pleasure. In the sexual positions condition, they also received a book called a playbook uh, containing various sexual positions, and there's 10 of them, and then asked to try five of these positions with each other uh, during the remaining of the study, the, the remaining two weeks. So we prescribed that behavior. Uh, within the WeVibe condition, I'll, I'll talk more about this, like it's uh, the WeVibe 4, I should say, because that's the model that uh, we used. Uh, couples were given a vibrator designed to be used uh, with, during intercourse. 
uh, the WeVibe 4, and instruct it in its use. Uh, so also, what's really interesting is uh, you can buy out there uh, like devices like dildos that uh, really look, uh, look at the shape and size and the color of, of a male penis, and you can buy uh, vulvas uh, that you can use for masturbatory purposes. Uh, or, in our case, uh, research uh, purposes. So we're able to show uh, people how to use uh, the, the vibrator. The most interesting email I ever received uh, was from Taylor, who said, uh, so someone seems to have stolen one of our vulvas uh, from, the, from the lab. And I, we thought long and hard about it. We decided if they found it, we didn't want it back. And they were asked to use the vibrator when trying the, the five sexual positions over the remaining two weeks. Of course, we had questions built in to look at adherence and so on. I don't have time to go through all of that today, and um, we're still analyzing the data, but I'll show you what the results are for the primary hypotheses. So, okay, uh, trigger warning, some pictures of people that are not real having sex. Uh, these are examples of three of the positions in the playbook. You can see here you have a get your kicks, uh, cross your heart, uh, an easy rider, otherwise known as reverse cowgirl, and you'll see that there's both images, how you can make this happen, uh, and there's also uh, written descriptions. So it says, you know, do this, lie this way, enter this way, rock back and forth, and so on. Uh, so now they have like, it's like, the, like a mini comma sutra of sorts. Uh, and uh, this is provided by the standard innovation company. The WeVibe itself looks, looks like this. When I showed it to some people, they're like, oh, I thought it'd be bigger. Uh, that's kind of a stereotype, maybe of porn. Uh, it fits in my glass case. Uh, and so you can see it here. And there are two primary components to it. One they call the G-spot uh, stimulator, and this is what enters uh, the vagina. And then you have here the clitoral stimulator, which when it goes in, it goes right up against uh, uh, the, the, the clitoris, and then you turn it on and it vibrates, both uh, providing uh, sensation to the clitoris as well as inside the vagina. Now, a lot of women I talked to said, please make this public service announcement on stage. Most women, or the majority of women, uh, do not orgasm without direct clitoral stimulation. So that's kind of one of the purposes of these, these devices, is that it can provide that during sexual intercourse, but at the same time, well, it can provide it to the woman, but also at the same time, you can still have sexual intercourse, because you can see this isn't very large. Uh, so now there's still room uh, for uh, uh, the male to enter. And I can also say that, indeed, it is a novel sexual experience using this for the first time. You have to put uh, lubrication on it. It can get slippery and fumble. Placing it is like kind of a little weird at first. There's some giggling and all that. So it's kind of like Art Aaron's original study with the medicine balls. Okay. Pre-registered data analytic plan. I'll just go through this. We assessed this at all the time points, and we had measures of relationship, intimacy, and passion. Uh, and for secondary outcome measures, sexual communication, sexual satisfaction, and relationship satisfaction. I'm not going to go into any more details on, on that. Uh, oh, sorry. You can go there for the link for uh, that plan. Now, I won't read through all of this, but this is what we pre-registered as our data analytic plan. Again, we've learned uh, since then, but the idea here was is here's our model. So post-intervention repeated measures will be crossed with individual couple members, level one, who are nested in romantic uh, dyads at the level two. So we're using a linear mixed model approach, taking into account the non-interdependence between the dyads, pre-post intervention, which is just kind of a fancier way of thinking of it as an ANCOVA uh, for pre-post uh, designs. I'm going to show some uh, uh, results, for, like just figures, and I'll kind of briefly walk you through it. They're not super fancy right now, uh, but uh, it gives you an idea of, of what we found. Okay, here, uh, what we did is, you see the scores, they can range from one to seven. So instead of saying, oh, we're only going to show the responses from four to six because it looks better and it makes it nice and big, uh, we just put it up at the whole range of the scores and the assessment time post. Uh, and we also statistically controlled pre with uh, the responses to these items. And then you can see the trajectory across those five assessments. The model I'm going to be talking about right now or the, uh, is where we first looked at the difference between the conditions at baseline. Uh, and then if there was something there, we'd move down the line. Uh, but you can see here, people, the groups seem to uh, may, meet up again by the fifth assessment. But there is some evidence, at least, that there's a mean difference in intimacy, but they, those p-values did not meet our uh, threshold for statistical significance. So, when I comment about, oh, the means are higher, I just mean they, they are higher, 
but statistically, the test did not uh, uh, meet our threshold for significance. But they did for passion. You can see here that uh, the we vibe group is on top, uh, and uh, the other two conditions are, are on the bottom, and self-reported passion. And uh, you can see the p-values there for the uh, first assessment, and you know that's significantly higher than the, both the other two. Uh, I also don't have it there, but it is at the second assessment as well, but then they start to converge again. So that suggests for about five to eight days, uh, couples that introduce novel sexual behavior, particularly with respect to using a Wii Vibe or a couple-oriented vibrator, they did kind of report heightened levels of passion compared to the other two groups controlling for their levels of passion prior to the intervention. So five to eight days. I know a lot of times in our interventions, we tend to study them within 40 minutes in the lab, so perhaps this is uh, uh, interesting. Now here, with respect to ease of sexual communication, uh, you, you see there's not much except for the WeVibe group being uh, uh, scoring higher than the uh, sex position group, and the same is with uh, sex, uh, sexual satisfaction. I'm not showing a figure for relationship satisfaction because there just were not, there was, was nothing there. So what we primarily find is with intimacy, means that are in the predicted direction, but not meeting our threshold for significance. Passion, yes, coming out as expected, but meeting up uh, uh, by the end of uh, the, the two weeks. And some differences, but ones that we're not 100% sure how, what to, to think of them with respect to this, uh, some of the secondary measures. So we have mixed support for our, our hypotheses. Not everything worked out as we perhaps thought uh, it, it might, uh, and there was a few surprises. But with intimacy, different direction, but not significant. Passion, I put that in, in red, it's, it's how fancy I get uh, with PowerPoint sometimes, um, is uh, differences uh, as predicted in the direction in p-values below the a priori determined threshold, and again, mixed with the secondary outcomes. I want to focus just a little bit here now on, say, some uh, lessons learned, but first, the differences, I say here they did not last very long, but how long should they last? Uh, we don't know. We've never done something like this before. Some people might say, that's pretty impressive, actually. Five to eight days, heightened passion for your partner. Uh, so now, what might that look like during those five to eight days? Well, maybe we now have uh, some insight into future studies that can look at that. Plus, what could boost it to keep it going? Some sort of booster shot, as it were, or secondary intervention that brings in another novel behavior uh, that involves uh, that... Uh, I, <laughs> Use your imagination. Um, so, okay. With respect to lessons learned, uh, this <laughs> my technical skills, so I'll just put, uh, went backwards. Our pre-registered hypotheses were somewhat vague. Now we're we're, we're working to be more specific. Uh, and to be more specific when we can, and then say when we're not sure exactly what we're going to find. We could have been more specific at that point and stated exactly in a particular model, uh, or sorry, this is exactly what we expect to find, and we're going to assess the trajectory over time because we're not sure, uh, whereas we did it all in one sentence. So we're working to be more specific when we can. Uh, the pre-registered data analytic plan could have been more precise. Uh, we thought we did a good job at the time, and it's true, but with these models, they are very complex. There's a lot of little things that you can do under the hood in terms of the different error estimates uh, and random effects or not. We actually pre-registered a model that had no random components in it because we wanted to make sure it would converge. Uh, so now, if you change the model up a little bit, uh, and I have this uh, in a later slide, uh, but uh, you can actually get those p-values for intimacy to be below our threshold. Uh, but at the same time, we didn't pre-register that model, and we'd want to be open with how uh, those p-values can be pushed around based on how you change certain things in that complex model. And issues pop up along the way. They always do. But decisions can be made uh, and documented. So we don't need to try to state everything you plan to do in advance. You can now state them as you go. As a quick side note, my students and I are starting to incorporate what's called open notebook uh, on our uh, project pages, not pre-registrations, but on our project page, where we actually document lab meetings and thoughts uh, and issues that pop up in our research along the way on our public page so future self can see what our decisions were as well as others. With some tweaking of the analytic code, we can get p-values below our, our threshold. I've already mentioned that, uh, but uh, so uh, there's a lot of things you can do with complex models uh, to kind of push things around. And trying to think about what those could look like in providing a guideline for how you're going to follow through with your analyses uh, can be very helpful, again, for future self so that you're not just making those decisions on the fly based on what you see in your data. Uh, with data in hand, it seems uh, pretty uh, perhaps obvious 
that results emerge for passion. People are like, oh, well, that makes sense. It's a sexuality-based intervention. Of course it should only affect passion. That wasn't obvious to us when we started. Uh, we had a lot of reasons to think that it could actually go beyond, say, simply passion. Uh, and perhaps it has somewhat for intimacy because we're following some other things up. But things always look more obvious after you've seen the data. We are planning more analyses uh, to be labeled more exploratory or to, that have followed from our, our uh, initial analyses. Uh, so in that sense, the weight is lifted off our shoulder. We don't have to worry about how do we package this and how do we say what we did and what we meant. Uh, well, is there, we've done this, we've now gone on and done these other things. And here's what we think it all means in the end. Thank you very much. Great, well, thank you all for coming and thanks for Chris and SPSP for being willing to sponsor um, such a cool symposium like this. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, a Tinder type study we did where we developed uh, a lab-based application where people could do swiping decisions similar to a mobile-based dating app that you uh, may have encountered, you or your friends may have encountered. Uh, so the market for mobile-based dating apps has really exploded in recent years and it's been able to provide people with um, plenty of connections for romance and friendship uh, in their lives based on GPS type of um, analyses. So um, from that basic premise, there's a lot of differences across all these different apps. They might connect you with uh, friends of friends or people you pass throughout the day. Um, they might even tell you which of your Facebook friends are single and match you based on that. Um, but the idea is that it, met, it gives you the availability to be matched. Uh, on some characteristics of the person that you'd like to date. There's also a sense that there's some services that match you based entirely on your interests and values, like, for example, the type of music you listen to. There's even a Tinder for dogs, which sounds exactly like what you think it is. And I hope what you think it is, is that dog owners can meet other dog owners for things like play dates, walking routes, uh, or maybe something more. Not for dogs to date other dogs, that would be ridiculous and very cool, but that doesn't exist right now. Um, but Tinder by far is the most popular of these dating apps. Um, it's used by a lot of different people. So the basic premise is that you're presented with a bunch of different profiles and um, you can sort of swipe right or left depending on whether you'd like to start a conversation with them. So um, the way it works is you are encountered with a profile and from that very moment you can swipe right or left on whether or not you'd like to talk to them eventually. Or you can tap on the profile and it expands it a little bit more. They might have a written bio, additional photos that tell you a little bit more about themselves. Um, and the idea is that you sort of gather information about whether or not you want to meet this person entirely. The availability of extra photos also proves the point that even the most handsome of social psychologists can occasionally take an unflattering photo. Um, so I lost a bet that forced me to include this photo in today's presentation. So that's me, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, basically the idea is that you're encountered with a bunch of eligible singles or people that you'd want to date, uh, and then you swipe right and left on them. And the idea is that if they then swipe right on you, it initiates the availability to, for you to eventually talk to them. So that's what Tinder essentially is. So to give you some background uh, into Tinder, if you're not familiar with it, um, the vast majority of people who use the app say that the people that they find on it are either on par or better than the people that they find in real life. So it's, there's a sense that they value the matches that they're getting. Um, in terms of who uses Tinder, there's more men on Tinder than women. Um, it's mostly used by single people, and when I say mostly, I'm saying that there's anywhere between 12 and 30% of Tinder users that are already in a relationship, but they're using the Tinder app. Um, the average user is in their late 20s, and there's probably this perception that a lot of people share that Using Tinder is primarily for hookup or casual sex purposes, but in studies that have actually asked people, hey, why do you use Tinder? What are you hoping to gain out of this? A lot of people say, I want a relationship. I want someone to date. Um, so there's a great proportion of people who use this dating app to find dates and people to find relationships with. So in trying to pre-register hypotheses for something like this, um, we went through the literature and thought of different ways you can actually test things in a Tinder-like setting. And we found quite a few. So these are our pre-registered analyses. Um, so we came up with an obvious one, uh, attractiveness. So not only other people's attractiveness, but yours as well. So 
when you see attractive singles or eligible partners, you probably want to swipe right on those. We want to date attractive people. But then there's a sense in which maybe you have insight into your own attractiveness, and those people might be more choosy. Maybe their standards are a little higher. Maybe they sort of think more about who they're going to date. Uh, because a lot of Tinder is based on uh, pictures of people, um, we're oftentimes attracted to symmetry in people's facial characteristics. So we find symmetry more attractive than asymmetry. Asymmetry we don't find uh, attractive. Um, I'm an attachment researcher, so we made some hypotheses about attachment. Although, actually, when you think about attachment, there's some research suggesting people who are avoidant might not like forming a lot of relationships, but then at the same time, there's some research where they take more opportunistic um, approaches towards casual sex behavior. So if this is a dating app about casual sex, maybe avoiding people might like it more. Um, if it is a dating app, maybe how you approach casual sex in general might predict it. So people who are really open to it might swipe right a lot. We thought that that was kind of an obvious uh, hypothesis as well. We also hypothesized about um, racial effects, so um, a sort of inconvenient thing that a lot of relationship researchers don't talk about is that there's massive racial biases and preferences in who we date. Um, the few studies that have been done, the effect sizes, sizes are pretty large. Um, so we, we, one thing that actually the pre-registration forced us to do is actually think about demographic characteristics that we might not have done otherwise. Um, we also had this additional hypothesis regarding um, black or African-American subjects particularly. And this was gleaned not from uh, the peer-reviewed literature, but actually a blog that OKCupid runs. So um, this graph is from their blog, which is a really cool resource. So the people on the left are the people sending a message, and the people on the top are who they're sending it to. And all the various percentages in that graph are the rate at which people respond. And you see that there's this um, red line across the very top of the graph. And that's basically um, black women sending out a bunch of messages to all sorts of racial ethnic groups and not hearing back. Um, and actually, if you read this particular blog post, um, black women are actually sending out the most messages but getting the least uh, responses. So based on this really cool OkCupid okay, data, we hypothesized that maybe if you're encountering black people on Tinder, participants might be less likely to swipe right on those people. Uh, so we also hypothesized about people in relationships. We thought maybe they'd take the task less seriously because they already have a partner. Um, there's also research that people in relationships tend to what's called derogate, derogate alternatives. So if they're really happy or really committed in the relationship, they tend to find attractive others less attractive than they objectively are. And then because um, a lot of these are based on facial characteristics, we made a bunch of hypotheses um, based on how people look, so um, women tend to find more dominant masculine and the ratio of width to height of a person's face particularly attractive. Uh, men look at the femininity of a face in determining whether or not it's attractive. And then we also like the prototypical faces, um, particularly ones that are within our own races. So does this person look like the prototype of uh, an average person for that race? So we weren't entirely sure how big the effects were, so we started with the conservative approach of just getting 500 people, a pretty large sample, and each of those individual people completed 200 trials. So that's one way in which we tried to enhance statistical power, give people a bunch of different choices. Um, so in the analyses today, the effective N for some of these analyses will range quite a bit, so sometimes it's 500, sometimes it's quite a, quite a bit, because they saw a lot of faces. Um, this is a very stripped down version of Tinder, so we got a bunch of stimuli from what's called the Chicago Face Database. So these are tons and tons of stimuli that are pre-rated on a bunch of those things that I just told you about, things like symmetry. Um, there's a great uh, racial variability in the data. Um, they pre-rate everything on their faces. We also did something a little different than what Lauren and Samina are gonna be talking about. Um, part of it was motivated by some things that we have seen in the public and the fact that maybe replication should at least, the onus of that should partially um, fall on the researchers generating the initial result. So we went in thinking, hey, we'll do this really cool study and we'll collect an entirely separate sample. So if we do a bunch of exploratory stuff on one sample, we'll confirm it and then do another pre-registration a second time before we even decide to write it up or start writing it up. 
So that was basic study. So they would encounter all these faces and then they'd indicate whether or not they'd swipe right or left on a keyboard. So the descriptive info is often really interesting um, by itself. So men tended to swipe right 15% of the time and women swiped right less often, about 10% of the time. They made these dating or swiping decisions really quickly. So if you wanted to date someone, they did it in about a second. And if you really didn't want to date someone, it took just over half a second for you to reject that person. Um, so that's the basic descriptive information. That's a significant gender difference. And this following forest plot are all of our hypotheses and uh, the confidence intervals. So um, newsflash, we like to date attractive people. I don't know if you knew this, but they're actually really good at being chosen to being asked out on dates. Um, there's also the same race effect, which is actually really quite large. So people were swiping right on people who uh, shared their race. Um, again, men tended to swipe right more. Um, we tended to swipe right more on the prototypic faces, so the average uh, aggregate face. And then there was a whole host of stuff that was not significant. So most of the facial characteristic and individual different stuff was not significant. Um, or at least they were dwarfed by things like how attractive they were, um, if they were the same race. Um, attractive people swiped right less often. So again, that's sort of the choosiness, sort of maybe they have insight into their mate value. And then um, if the target or the face was black, um, people swiped left more. So that confirmed the OKCupid okay data in this sort of newer swiping context. So that's the decision data about who swipes right or left. But the really cool thing is we can um, map some of these decisions down to the millisecond. So this is a separate forest plot about how quickly people make decisions. And it looks like the stuff that's forcing or having people swipe right also has them looking at the photos longer. Um, so we tend to look longer at races that are the same as us. Men tend to look at uh, photos of women longer. Um, again, there's this prototypicality um, effect. Um, that If we're attractive, we look at them less often. Uh, people in relationships were just as likely to swipe right as single people, so it didn't look like they were taking the task any less seriously, or they were more choosy or more selective. It looks like they were on par with single people in this context. And then um, participants looked very quickly at black faces. It looks like just before they rejected them. So typical decision-making studies will do exactly what I just did. They'll tell you, hey, this is what the decisions that happened, and then how quickly um, those were made, collapsing across whether they were swiping right or left. Uh, but one cool exploratory thing we did with this particular study is what's called the drift diffusion model. And this is a sequential sampling model that is used to make binary decisions. So basically, it works under the assumption that you're looking at some sort of stimuli and you're gathering information about whether or not you want to swipe right or left. That's basically the whole premise, that there's this sequential sampling. Um, the idea is that you're gathering information, or what they call evidence, about whether or not to swipe right or left. Um, and I don't have a ton of time to go into this, so it's a very superficial explanation, but it estimates a few really cool and important parameters. So across all of these trials that people see, you can see if there's some sort of bias to swipe right or left. So regardless of what photo you see, are you more choosy, basically? Are you more likely to swipe right or left? And then what predicts that thing? There's also a threshold, so uh, how much evidence do you need? Or how much time do you need to look at a photo before you decide, hey, I want to date this person? And then, importantly, there's what's called the drift rate. And this maximizes the type of information you can get from decision-making data. Um, so typically, they look at those things separately, or they take reaction times from these trials, minus reaction times from those trials, minus the different reaction times. That's how the IAT is actually scored. Um, but things like the drift rate are really cool because um, they can look at the quality of evidence for swiping right. So, um, looking at how quickly you make swipe right decisions, can you predict is attractiveness leading more to that evidence gathering? So you can weigh the basic importance about what the most successful Tinder users are doing. So that, that's the basic gist of it. An extremely complicated thing described very, very superficially and very, very shortly. Um, so these are some of the exploratory analyses. It looks like the same race effect and the attractiveness effects are being used and weighed extremely heavily when people are making these Tinder swiping decisions. And the really cool thing about this model is that after you control for the attractiveness uh, features, the gender bias that I showed you earlier about men swiping right more 
uh, goes away. And it's this really interesting methodological thing in relationships research where you ask men and women to rate how attractive they find uh, men and women, and men find women very attractive. And that's one of the reasons why they're swiping right so often, because they're so beautiful in men's eyes. But after you control for that, and again, we can talk about sort of what that means. Um, is it because they want uh, more sexual sort of interactions with these people? Um, it goes away. Um, so to summarize, people are making decisions really quickly, um, oftentimes less than a second, especially if you don't want to date someone. Um, how attractive they are and the race of that person are the largest predictors. Um, they dwarf the effects of all these things that relationship researchers generally find are important. Um, it looks like individual differences didn't matter much, and there's actually some evidence for that. So from studies of speed dating and other characteristics, um, other studies, these characteristics might not affect more automatic decisions, but um, there are a bunch of other contexts in which they could. So if you want to see who's probably going to use Tinder in the first place, maybe avoidant people are less likely to download a dating app in general. Or after they match, um, there's a conversation usually that happens immediately after that, and maybe there's some individual differences that come through with that. And we know that because there's a bunch of communications research that shows that personality attachment affects how people communicate. There's also um, some research into looking at sort of the nature of these dating apps. So there's a sense when you are going through a bunch of choices, you are thinking of these choices less as people and more like products, especially when you're making very quick decisions. And then you see a few decision-like processes that normally don't come up. So the paradox of choice, when you have too many choices and you're not sure what to pick. Um, people have found that in online dating sites, uh, website research. So we're interested in looking at that kind of thing. We're also trying to think of Tinder-like features we can introduce. So there's this feature where you can be told if the person you're looking at has already liked you. And from a relationship research perspective, that's super interesting. So we tend to like people who like us and we tend to accept them and want to date them. But then the cool thing about the drift diffusion model is that it can say, okay, do we just in general like people who like us? Or does the fact that they like us change our perceptions of them? So do I look at the photos a little longer? Do I start featuring specific things in the photo? Oh, do they have a dog in the photo? Oh, I'll definitely swipe right on that. Um, maybe I'm envisioning our future together or sort of doing much of mental simulation with these photos. So the drift diffusion model can really tease apart a lot of these basic processes about how we even make the judgments of, hey, that person is someone I wanna to talk to. And then of course, we're looking forward to the replication. We have this entirely separate sample that we can do a lot of crazy exploratory research in one, and then before we try to disseminate it, we can actually check ourselves before we start making crazy claims that don't replicate and then blame replicators for something that they tried to do. That's right. Um, so I was asked to um, give a few uh, reflections, like Lauren did, on this um, experience. And pre-registration was really great. Um, it gave us a stronger confidence in our findings. It led to deeper thinking. So. Um, I, I don't really study race or racial preferences or um, biases like that, but the fact that we had to sit down and pre-specify everything made us go through the literature and say, hey, this is a pretty large effect and it might dwarf all the things that I'm actually interested in. And the fact that we sort of wrote this out ahead of time, now the literature will have findings that say, hey, attachment might not be useful for these particular decision-making processes. And that's good because it prevents other people from doing that study or changing the study in some way. Um, the conformatory uh, model is something that I'm really looking forward to. I'll also give a brief comment that this was the, that was brought about uh, yesterday, that pre-registration might kill creativity, uh, which couldn't be further from the truth. So I think one person could look at these particular findings and be like, oh, that's so stupid. Like, of course you would hypothesize that attractive people are winning in life and wanting to be dated. Um, but not only the race effects, but from this initial study, we've started thinking about the role of individual differences in more general, so um, in dating processes. So at what point do our personalities tend to infect the dating process? Is it a selection effect where you know, it brings people to the table to be in these dating contexts? Or maybe it happens when we're talking to each other afterwards. Um, so to close, it's been largely positive. I will be doing it more. I encourage you to be doing it more. Um, because I think it would be the start of something really great. So thank you.
think I was supposed to end my talk one minute ago, which is great because it gives me an excuse to talk really fast. Um, but I will post the slides on OSF, so don't worry if you miss something. Um, also, thank you for coming to this instead of the ego depletion controversy. Does anyone know the score on ego depletion? Um, okay, so Fraley invited me to be part of the symposium, and I really wanted to be part of the symposium, but I also knew that the kind of research I do, there was no chance I could pre-register a study in July and have it done in time for um, this talk. Um, the last study I've run in my lab, I started applying for funding to do it in 2009. Four tries later, I got funding. We began data collection in 2012. We've had over 200 undergraduate research assistants involved in the study. I've had, I think, six graduate students. All of my graduate students, seven, I'm not sure. All the grad students I've ever had have worked on this study and have worked primarily, all but one has worked primarily on this study. Um, and we're still not done. So pre-registration is impossible because for our one study that I could talk about, most of the data already exists and we've already analyzed some of it, and new data collection on similar topics would be impossible because we're just not that masochistic. Um, so the solution came to me um, when I was thinking about this thing that happened on Twitter a, few, a, a year or two ago about research parasites, and this was from a New England Journal of Medicine editorial where they talked about their concern with open data, that some new class of research person will emerge who had nothing to do with the design and execution of the study, but use another group's data for their own ends, et cetera. This is a concern among some frontline researchers that the system will be taken over by what some researchers have characterized as research parasites. I'm pretty sure they invented that term, so by some researchers, they mean themselves. Um, and I thought, great, thank God for research parasites. So this gave us uh, the opportunity to try to do something in a more confirmatory way despite the dilemma that we were in. So our solution, our plan was to share our code book with other researchers and solicit new hypotheses to test and they would come up with hypotheses. Then to have a third party choose from among those submitted hypotheses, register the hypotheses, run the analyses and report whatever comes out. Uh, due to laziness and other constraints, we decided to only solicit hypotheses from two teams, so there was no need to select which hypotheses to run, so we didn't have a third party select them. So we solicited new hypotheses from two labs, Will Hoffman's lab and then Alex Danvers, and I did give some feedback to them regarding the feasibility of the hypotheses, so like if they were planning to study a subgroup within our sample that I knew was small, I would just give them a heads up about that, and then I also asked them to keep it simple enough to convey in a 15 minute talk. Um, the, those labs registered their analysis plans, um, and then we sent them the variables necessary to run their analysis, so they had our code books so they could tell us exactly what variables they needed. They reported what they found, and that's what I'm gonna show you today. So there's no file drawer, and there's no researcher degrees of freedom if you trust the pre-registration to be clear enough, and we asked them whenever possible to use the actual variable names and so on, so I think they were quite specific. So the study had 434 participants. They were college students at WashU. Um, we collected self and informant reports. We had multiple waves, but a lot of attrition, so most of the interesting questions can be asked only at the first wave. We had experience sampling for two weeks at three of the waves. Again, the first wave was the only one with a large sample. And we also have behavior from the electronically activated recorder and life history interviews, but those are what's still being coded, so those were not available for this project. Our code books are up at this link, they're publicly available. Um, there's many, many of them, and just to give you an idea, just this one has 31 tabs in the Excel spreadsheet. Um, so there's like 6,000 variables, I think, at the last, then we're still adding more variables as we're coding the behavior. Um, so these teams that agreed to do this had a lot of stuff to wade through. Um, they were unfamiliar with the data, that, so the, the data set is not public at this point. We have published a few papers with this data set, and we've posted the data necessary to reproduce those results, but I don't think these teams were super familiar with those papers, and I think their hypotheses were different enough from what we've done with the data set in the past, but so it's not completely, it is possible for them to know something about the data set. So the first team um, wanted to look at Facebook use and well-being. So from here on, the, these slides were created with sm slight modifications by me, um, by this team. So Leonard Reinecke, Adrian Meyer, and Will Hoffman. And I'm gonna zip through them, I apologize. This, basically, they would each be able to give 15-minute talks on their research question and why they had that research question and so on, but again, I will post the slides. But mainly, they were interested in whether passive use of Facebook was associated with negative effects on 
well-being, and active use of Facebook would be associated with positive effects. There's a literature that would support these predictions. Um, and they were interested in two particular mediator variables, perceived authenticity, so self-reported authenticity and self-reported connectedness. So the research questions were, is active Facebook use compared to passive Facebook use associated with higher levels of authenticity and connectedness, and then does that predict higher levels of well-being? Um, and so there, they had a model basically down here where active Facebook use would predict well-being through authenticity Passive Facebook use would predict lower well-being through lower connectedness, um, or some something like that. There were there was some I think room for different paths that could lead to the outcomes, but the idea was that active Facebook use would be positively associated with well-being through some, one or both of these mediators. Passive Facebook use would be negatively associated with well-being through one or both of these mediators. Um, all variables were measured using experience sampling. Um, there we have. Pretty like okay response rate on experience sampling in this data, um, and again it was for four, two weeks, up to four reports per day. This is what their pre-registration looked like. Again, I'm sorry to go th so fast through these, but I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so what they found? So they found evidence that active Facebook use was associated with greater state authenticity. Um, and it was associated with greater state connectedness relative to passive Facebook use, but mostly because passive Facebook use was associated with feeling less connected. And then those two mediators were associated with well-being. These were not time-lagged analyses, but we do, since we have repeated measures, we could do that, and that was part of their original uh, hypothesis and pre-registration. I asked them to simplify because of time and so on. But they are intending to also look, um, control for T minus one uh, levels of these these variables. Okay, so they conclude that the results underline that Facebook use is significantly associated with well-being, and specifically active Facebook use is associated with authentic experiences, and that's in turn associated with well-being at the state level, so momentary well-being. Passive Facebook use is negatively related with state connectedness, and downstream from that, there are uh, negative indirect associations with well-being. So that's the first, uh, the result of the first lab's uh, pre-registration. The second lab looked at does romantic attachment style change how our partners see us? Um, I like that these two questions were so different from each other. So one had to do with experience sampling and, and positive experiences, social connectedness and well-being. The other one is about accuracy and person perception and different types of relationships. So the question here was, um, what do others see about us? How accurately do they see us? And do our friends and romantic partners see us differently? And specifically, do our, does our attachment style affect how our partners see us, but not how our friends see us? So our judgments of personality traits made by a romantic partner more influenced by the target's romantic attachment style than judgments by friends. So the model had judgments of personality being predicted by attachment style, whether the informant was a romantic partner or a friend, and the interaction of those two variables. And the, the key predictions were that the target's avoidant attachment would predict partners, uh, would moderate partners' judgments of extroversion. So partner status and avoidant attachment would interact to predict judgments of extroversion such that partners would perceive avoidant people as less extroverted. And anxious attachment would moderate um, the uh, effect of relationship status on judgments of neuroticism such that people who are more anxious are, would be perceived by their partners as more neurotic. This is the key part of the pre-registration. So moving on to the results, um, for avoidance and extroversion, there was, oops, the, whoa, why is the left graph not showing up? Hmm, that's weird. So in both cases, there were two main effects and no interaction. So for extroversion, um, uh, people who are avoidantly attached are perceived as less extroverted by both partners and friends. Partners perceive the targets as less extroverted than do friends, but there's no interaction. For neuroticism, anxiously attached people are perceived as more neurotic by both partners and friends. Partners perceive targets as more neurotic than do friends, but there's no interaction. So in both cases, the key hypothesis was not supported or the key test did not come out significant. So I rushed through those. I think there's a lot to be said substantively about both of those hypotheses and I don't wanna minimize the the kind of richness of the questions that these two teams asked, and I know I didn't do them service. Um, but I want to emphasize, since the theme of the symposium is on pre-registration and, and results independent reporting of, of studies, um, the question is how does this apply to secondary data, and especially for hard to collect 
data sets, we want to make sure that we value those and reward people who are putting time in to collect those. Um, but we need to make sure we don't reward them more than is possible. We can't get something out of those data sets that's not possible. So for example, I can't pre-register anything in these data sets. I know the data sets too well. We still register our analyses to try to keep track of what we're planning to do and how we change from that, that plan, but we can't pre-register them. Um, so it's not pre possible to pre-register new analyses from data sets we've already played with, but others can, and there's an asterisk there to the extent that they're not familiar with the data set. So the more we publish off of this data set, the harder it'll be to find people who can pre-register new research questions. On the other hand, with 6,000 variables, hopefully there's still a decent amount of unfamiliarity with some parts of the data set, although we could talk about whether being familiar with different variables could influence could make your analyses data dependent in some ways, even for new variables. Um, so we still register our analyses, as I mentioned, and we could also um, register our standard operating procedures. So in trying to think through what can we do in this situation where I couldn't just say yes to Chris Fraley, I'm gonna pre-register a new study to test my substantive research questions. Um, we haven't done that, so note to self, we should <laughs> register our lab standard operating procedures. Um, so here's the link again for the codebook. If any of you are interested, we're open to collaborations, et cetera. Um, we need to figure out how to make the data publicly available. There's a lot of problems with re-identification risk with all these informant reports, et cetera, but we're working towards eventually hoping being, we hope to be able to do that or at least make it available with a very simple way to request it. Um, but for now, you can at least find all the code books at this link. These are some of our research assistants. And I also want to thank all of the students, graduate students, undergraduates who've made this study possible. So thank you. Um, so one of the questions that was asked was that there was a lot of focus on some of the benefits that you experienced from using registration in some of your projects here. And I, the question is, to what extent did you have negative experiences in registration? What were some of the downsides of doing this in hindsight? And this is directed to all of you. Bill, you want to start with some of your thoughts? Uh, yeah, it took time. And I think that that's a necessary precondition for doing science now. It, it, we, we had David Johnson, who's here, him and I had multiple meetings for how do we model these things, what variables do we include. Um, and that's a good thing, because otherwise I think, especially a lot of labs in the field, might be like really quick and loose with running studies. They might just throw something out just because they feel they need something to run in a given semester. But uh, it forced us to actually sit and think about it. So time, effort, anguish uh, when the results come in. But ultimately, by and large, the balance was that it was a good experience. And I'll keep this really brief and just say that, uh, yes, it takes uh, time, and, time and effort, like you say, but then it helps uh, d uh, defer that time uh, later on, meaning you're, you know, we're going to spend less time writing things up uh, down the road. But what I really liked is that it helped organize everything on the page. I know where everything is. I can go find it. I don't have to ask Taylor in Croatia to send me a file. Uh, and uh, so going forward, future self is going to be a lot happier uh, about that. Uh, so in that sense, I, our experience was, I would say, majority positive. Did any of your people say anything about it? Um, I don't think so. I don't know if Will's team is here, but Alex, I don't know if you had any. Ne there was there were a lot of emails back and forth, <laughs> you know. But wishing for fewer emails is like wishing for a unicorn ride to Candyland. So. Um, another question: How many of you have unicorns? Um, <laughs> My daughter claims to have one. <laughs> is it possible that? Well, let's see. Is it possible? Does it make sense to submit a study for pre-registration while collecting data, but before running the analyses? Do you all have thoughts on that? I think this is the kind of thing where ideally you would do it before, but I think we're in a period where a lot of us are practicing with pre-registration, so I think if that's your best option, then do it, and then you know, next time do a little better. My working definition of pre-registration is literally just stating in advance what you plan to do prior to doing it in a way that's verifiable by others. And in that sense, uh, and just being open and upfront with where you're currently at, we're, we're running the study, data's in, we've not looked at it, uh, here's why we chose to run the study this way, and here's how our, we're going to, uh, our guideline for running the hypotheses, whatever they happen to be. Samin said, I think yesterday, something is better than nothing, so at the very least, you know, make the effort and then just try to do better next time and then Hopefully, we'll be good someday. Okay. Um, thank you very much, guys, for speaking. I really appreciate it. And um, we've hit our time limit, but hopefully, everybody can stick around if people have individual questions they'd like to ask. Thank you for attending today.